Hello and welcome. Trying out this floating head over picture uh, approach again. All right, got the thumbs up. Good to go. So for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. This week we're visiting Everglades National Park. We'll also vote near the end on which national park we want to go to next week. So keep an eye out for that and other uh, chats, polls, questions in the in the chat. Uh, also feel free to post thoughts or ideas or or anything as we go. I love talking with all of you. So uh, so feel free to, to throw anything out there that comes to mind. Small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, uh, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this at home. I've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wikipedia pages. Using Wikipedia, make sure the facts here are cited and checked by others and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. To that end, if you notice anything missing or that could be clarified, please help improve the Wikipedia pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. So without further ado, I'm Jules Altis, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Everglades National Park. Let's see if I can get my takeoff roll going right out of that. Hey, look at that. Thank you very much, Fractals. So we got our first uh, poll up here. Uh, who has been to the National Park before? I'll let people respond to that while I get myself rolling. So I have not been to Everglades. I've been in the general area. I really should have stopped by, um, especially after researching the park. I'm so much more interested in it. Let's see. Hey, a flying singer. Flying as uh, CAP tonight. Cadet Memories. Is that a CAP, like the type of plane? I'm not sure I understand that. Get some takeoff here. Yep, fractals or uh, pole may not be working here. At least on my side, it's looking like zero votes, but I'm seeing some votes come through. So it looks like a couple of people have uh, have been there. At least fractals has. So I've done this in in past weeks. I typically try to show how I set up my autopilot so that you can see in case it's useful to anyone else. Um, so I'll do a quick quick setup here, make sure I can still see my airspeed indicator. Okay, so I'm switching on to nav mode, and then uh, I'm going to have it hold altitude once I get to about a thousand feet. And the park only has an elevation that goes from about zero to 20 feet, so anywhere above 100 feet and you will be uh, good to go in the park. All right, I'll flip out so we can look around just for a second longer here. Civil Air Patrol. Oh, you're in the Civil Air Patrol. That's awesome. I was actually just looking into uh, into the local chapter here. Did you did you enjoy it? All right, and then I'll flip on this hold altitude mode. Let's see if that works. Oops, gotta do these differently. There we go. All right. Let's see how my six-pack autopilot's working. Uh, interestingly, I was in a plane training on a Piper Dakota this weekend, and it has the exact same Garmin sort of navigation system, so I was practicing this weekend. Was a little Let's see. Yeah, I clawed back to the stream. For some reason, it isn't in here. Oh, okay. Oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, can you do, uh, here, fractals, I can give it a try. Otherwise, um, Let's see, this is what. Let's see how that works. Oh, it says it's already a moderator. Yeah, it's not in here. That's pretty weird. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll have to do. Uh, we'll have to do tallies by hand then. But it seems like our poll still showed up, so that's good. All right. So I'll just do a quick scan then. Uh, we had a couple people who have been there once upon a time, a couple people in the last year or so, that's awesome, and then a couple uh, in the same camp as me, so haven't been there yet, um, but hopefully by the end of the stream you'll be excited to go visit. Uh, so Fractals, I'm going to hide the poll then and we'll just, we'll wing it. I don't know why Streamlabs isn't around, it's, you know, it says it's already a moderator, so maybe it's something uh, that's going on there.
Expo Flying Stinger. That sounds fun. Um, that would be a, a, a great experience, I think. Something I'm going to look into once I get a little bit further in my flying career. All right, so we are taking off over uh, Shark Val, or I'm sorry, the um, uh, Shark River uh, Slough. And we'll have the Shark Valley Visitor Center coming up in just a little bit here. Now, I'm going to actually change the uh, time of day just a little bit so we get a bit more color in the background here. Although you'll find that it's very, um, very similar sort of terrain for the first part of our flight, which is uh, not nice. Oh, I forgot to mention, so we're flying a Cessna 172. So this is a classic uh, trainer plane. It's one that a lot of a lot of pilots have spent a little bit of time or a lot of time in, depending on your background. Also, did anyone get a chance to work in overburden into their uh, last week's random conversations? I, I managed to squeeze it in at work. I said something, uh, I don't remember exactly what, but it's some sort of sort of joke on it. Oops. Um, so I don't know if anyone else got the uh, the overburden achievement for the week, um, but I had fun kind of seeing where I could where I could squeeze it in. Uh, okay, so Everglades National Park to kind of talk a little bit more about the park itself preserves the largest subtropical wilderness in the nation, a vast natural area in the southern Everglades and Florida Bay, known throughout the world for its unparalleled ecological values, natural hydro hydro uh, hydrologic conditions vibrant cultural heritage, and unique recreational and educational opportunities. It's a very famous park across uh, the country and across the world. Before we get too far into the park, it's really useful to see how water flows through the park. Um, I'll zoom out on the iPad here just a little bit so you can kind of do a side-by-side -side of where we're going to fly today. But this is uh, a picture from the National Park site. It's a little small, so you have to forgive the, uh, the size, but it's the best one that I could find. Let me pull this up here. All right, so we have this um, this huge lake that's that's up here and supplies a lot of the water to the other cities on the edge here, and then water flows down through there into Everglades National Park and out into Florida Bay. So this is Everglades National Park. We're going to actually fly right along the slough here. We'll fly out to Florida Bay and then we'll come back along to 10,000 Islands. So we're kind of following the path of the water. One of the things that I, I didn't know when I started is that the uh, although the Everglades are thought of as a wetlands, it's actually an enormous, slow-moving river. Uh, so it's some 200 miles long of a river, and it moves at a pace of about 0.5, uh, excuse me, uh, a quarter of a mile each day. So as far as river goes, uh, pretty pretty slow-moving, pretty wide river. Um, and that's sort of the, the area we'll be flying over in, in just a moment here. You also notice in that picture that a lot of the water was diverted for humans. So there was more of a river that used to flow through, and then there was a lot of concern over the damage that humans coming to the area was causing. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment with our person of the week. Okay, so now that you know a couple of, of bits about the park, there is a great park overview with a friendly ranger, uh, Mason. So let me pull that up real quick. And he's going to walk through the key habitats of Everglades National Park. Uh, so keep an eye out for the different types of, of wildlife and different types of habitats that he talks about. And then a little bit about how water moves through the park. So kind of building on what we just talked about. It's got some slower interludes. It's, it's got a couple of sections where it's just images of the park. Uh, but it does a really good job, I think, of capturing some of the really key elements of the park. So we'll play it all the way through. If you want to know why you're so tired so often, look at this banana. It's fresh, brightly colored. Looks. I had an ad at the beginning. I don't know when none of the other national parks have ads. All right, there we go. Welcome to Everglades National Park. I'm Ranger Mason and I'll be your guide for what to see and where to be along the main park road.
Here we are at the Co Visitor Center. This is a great place to start your trip and plan your journey through the Everglades. You can go inside and pick up a map and speak to a ranger. You can also pick up a schedule of our ranger-led programs for that day. And how long does it take to get all the way? Through? All the way to Flamingo, it's about an hour, 38 miles. It's a beautiful drive there. Today, we're going to be headed from the entrance all the way down to Flamingo. And along the way, we'll be stopping at Royal Palm, Long Pine Key, Pahiokee Overlook, Mahogany Hammock, West Lake, and finally Flamingo. As you drive through the park, look out for wildlife crossing the road and make sure to pay attention to all the road signs. A lot of people, when they come here for the first time, are expecting to see a deep, dark swamp. And they're amazed to really see a mosaic of habitats that include open freshwater sloughs, pinelands, hardwood hammocks, cypress domes, and mangrove swamps. So the area that we are standing at is Royal Palm. It's one of the favorite stops of visitors in the Everglades, mainly for the Anhinga Trail. It's a trail that walks you out into the marsh and uh, you get to see a lot of wildlife. During the winter, the water levels drop. Everything is concentrated right here, giving you this great opportunity to see the wildlife up close. You know, everything is living its life in tune with this up high and low water levels, whether it be fish, alligators, birds, they're all in one way or another kind of living their life in tune with that. Oh, oh here's a, an Anhinga catching a fish. Oh my god, he's a fish! A fish! Oh, 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 oh. Whoa! Oh, oh, oh. Look at that fish! Oh, man, I That's what people say, they look out there and they're like, it looks like a, you know, Kenyan grasslands or something, but. This, what we're looking out at is Shark River Slough. Shark River Slough is the main part of the Everglades. When Marjorie Silman Douglas wrote that book, River of Grass, this is what she was talking about. And it's all a flow of water and it's coming down through these sawgrass prairies, heading down south, eventually making its way out into the Gulf of Mexico. All right, are you guys ready to head on down to Mahogany Hammock? stop is going to be walking inside one of those, a mahogany hammock. And those areas are literally islands out in the marsh. They might only be a foot or two higher, but they're high enough so that even during the summer when the water levels rise, they don't flood. And then those hardwood trees, those gumbo limbos and mahogany trees can take root and they form these tree islands there. And so Shark River Slough all the way down is dotted by these tree islands. 
you can see just what, you know, what a different habitat this is than when we were standing out in that open marsh. And that really is, if there's one thing that you'll see today as you go down the road, it's going to be the diversity of habitats. So, you know, you not only have the, the open sawgrass marshes, but right side by side, you know, you've got this dense tropical forest that's shaded, completely different wildlife, you know, living in these things. Elevation plays a huge role out here. And you probably look out at this landscape and think, you know, what elevation? There is, there's nothing, you know, it's, it's as flat as it gets. But uh, the difference of just several inches to one foot can make the difference of what kind of plant community is growing. And it all has to do with water levels. Uh, your lower spots are going to hold water for longer out of the year. And so uh, that's where you get marshes. Meanwhile, uh, hardwood trees, it's uh, generally not going to want to grow out of areas that are flooded for most of the year, and it won't grow out there in the marsh. Just a quick sidebar while we're flying over it. So he mentioned that a couple of feet difference will completely change the habitats. And so if you look at this part of the world from the sky like we are, you can see there's slightly darker areas with patches of trees. So that would be where the land is like one or two feet higher and so it doesn't get flooded for you know the majority of the year, uh, which means that you can have completely different kinds of habitats. So when you're looking at it without that knowledge, it's kind of just looks like a bunch of trees randomly around, uh, but that's why it looks like that. So here we are at the end of our journey. We've gone from the entrance of the park all the way down to Flamingo. And along the way, we've passed through sawgrass prairies, a pine forest, tropical hardwood hammocks, mangrove forests. And now we find ourselves in the Flamingo area, which overlooks Florida Bay. Florida Bay is the recipient of all of the fresh water that we were looking at today. When we were standing at Taylor Slough, the water that was flowing through those sawgrass prairies was slowly making its way to this shallow ocean bay. Well, thanks for joining me on this trip down the main park road. Enjoy your trip. Thanks, Ranger Mason. I heard that my, I got a cue card that my voice is too quiet in the microphone, so I'll let me know on why if I need to get louder or softer. All right, so that was kind of a, a whirlwind tour of the different habitats here. Uh, we'll cover a little bit more of the park than he went down, but we're passing through that uh, Merrill Prairie, and you can kind of see on the map some of these other uh, types of, of ecosystems that will fly over. That at least at a high level though, is the overview of Everglades. So uh, it's all about the water, it's all about the ecosystem. It was the first national park set up not to protect some sort of structure like a mountain or a, a thing that you would go and see, and instead it was set up to protect an ecosystem. 
And so that makes it unique among the national parks. Uh, it was the first one to be like that. Uh, but it also makes it unique as a place to go visit because you can go and see lots of different types of animals and plants and something that's pretty, pretty special across the whole globe. Fractals, okay, so Fractals and I were chatting on Discord trying to figure out the poll situation, uh, and the answer is probably not going to work, so um, we'll figure out what's going on with that uh, another time, but I also am noticing that my game is getting very choppy. I'm wondering, it's either weather, nope, okay, well, there was a big world update that just happened for the uh, Microsoft Flight Sim, so my suspicion is that something in that update has has caused my game to it seems to go about one second then pause and one second pause but it's okay you still get the same sort of sort of idea of the park so with that let's move on to our first topic uh which oh thank you hey <laughs> thanks freckles our first topic which is uh alligators and crocodiles, crocodilia in general. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, American crocodile, al American alligators, excuse me, and American crocodiles, both of them. And I'm seeing my first answer here is a little bit cut off. So I'll read that one, which is they burrow in the mud during the day dry season, creating pools of water where fish and amphibians survive from one year to the next. That's the, the first answer on there. Uh, the question is, what makes the American alligator a keystone species in the Everglades? So they burrow in the mud and they create these pools. Or they're the mascot of the most sports teams, or of enough sports teams. Definition of a keystone species. And then, uh, or they weren't meant to be, but no one had the guts to tell them. Good people said no. Already two for the not enough guts to tell them. After reading about them, I, uh, I think that's probably a fair assessment. Give folks a definite response on that one. So a bit of connection to the park. We'll talk mostly about American alligators and, and American crocodiles because those are most relevant to the park, but there's tons of different types of uh, crocodilia that this apply to. So I'll, I'll kind of make it clear when I'm talking about a specific a species versus the, the animal in general. So for crocodiles and how they relate to the park, in the United States, the American crocodile's only habitat is within South Florida. There are about 2,000 crocodiles that live in Florida and roughly 100 nests in the Everglades and the uh, Biscayne National Park. I should know how to say that, so sorry if I'm getting that one wrong. Uh, we'll go to Bis Biscayne National Park another day. Uh, crocodiles populations in South Florida have increased as have the number of alligators, as have the number of alligators. So both crocodiles and alligators are on the, on the rise for population. Crocodiles were classified, were reclassified from endangered to threatened back in 2007. As for alligators, alligators play a vital role in maintaining their life in remote parts of the Everglades by burrowing in the mud during the dry season and then creating a pool of water where fish and amphibians survive from one year to the next. So for those of you who answered uh, number or letter A on this one, that is the correct answer. So they, they do this thing where they, they burrow in the mud. And remember that one or two feet of difference of elevation is all that, uh, or makes a huge difference to the animals in the ecosystem. And so with an alligator burrowing in the mud, and that creates its own uh, place for life to survive into the, into the dry season. A couple of differences between alligators and crocodiles that are, are useful to be aware of. So the most obvious uh, one is, is the most easy to see is in the shape of their head. So crocodiles have narrower, longer heads, and a little bit more like a V shape. I'll pull the picture of that. There we go. I'm going to mention this at the beginning because I think it's just the funniest thing ever, which is because um, crocodiles have uh, have not really needed to evolve since uh, the time of the dinosaurs. So them and birds are some of the only animals that are, are around from that time period. I don't talk much more about that in, in this episode or in, in the episode, whatever, in this uh, stream because um, it's not it's more about the fossil part. But uh, it's sort of like if you put it in the frame of like this is the pinnacle of evolution. Oops. Uh, it's a pretty funny way to think about alligators. Alligators and crocodiles. Okay, so anyway, uh, the crocodile head has this sort of V-shape to it. You can see through there. And the alligator, on the other hand, has more of a U-shape. 
So there's the crocodile, or sorry, the alligator with the U shape, and then the crocodile with that B shape. So that's the easiest way to tell them apart. Crocodiles also have more webbing in their toes uh, and their hind feet, to be and they better tolerate salt water due to a specialized salt gland that filters out salt. That same gland is present in alligators, but it's not functioning. So for crocodiles, it's, a, it's an asset. American alligators are also less vulnerable to cold than American crocodiles. So unlike the American crocodile, which would immediately succumb to cold and drown in water at less than 20, uh, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, the American alligator can survive in uh, temperatures in those temperatures for some time without displaying any kind of discomfort. Uh, that adaptiveness is, is thought to be why American alligators are widespread further north than the American crocodile. I would also say that I relate more to the crocodile in that preference for the warmer temperatures. I don't know if I would uh, drown in 45 degree water, but I certainly would show signs of discomfort. All right, so that's a little bit about the difference between the two. I'm going to talk a little bit about alligators first, and then I'll talk a little bit about crocodiles, and then I'll talk about what crocodilians in general have uh, in common. So first with alligators, I mentioned they have that U-shaped snout. Biz cane. <laughs> Thanks, rectals. I should have. Anyway, yeah. Um, I like my pronunciation better. Anyway, so uh, alligators, remember that U-shaped snout. The name alligator is probably an Angli uh, anglicized form of el lagarto, which is the Spanish term for the lizard. Sometimes referred colloquially uh, as a gator or a common alligator, it's a larger croc uh, crocodilian reptile native to the southeastern United States and south uh, and northeastern uh, Mexico. Adult male American alligators measure from between 11 and 15 feet in length and can weigh, so about you know, two people long, and can weigh up to 1,000 pounds. Females are smaller. They measure about 8.5 to 10 feet or so in length. The American alligator inhabits freshwater uh, wetlands such as marshes and the cypress swamps. That's where they would be burrowing out in the, the fields where we are now. Natural habitat for them, and it's a little more freshwater. American alligators primarily bask on shore, but they'll also climb and perch on tree limbs to bask if no shoreline is available. Uh, this is not often seen since if disturbed, they quickly retreat into the water by jumping from their perch. So if you do come across them hanging out in a tree limb, they'll, uh, they'll get out of there pretty quick. And like I mentioned at the beginning, they play an important role in the ecosystem uh, by building the alligator holes, which provide wet and dry habitats for other organisms. And that is why it's considered a keystone, keystone species in the area. Also, I won't talk much more about um, uh, their young and, and how their, their growth cycles work, but the baby alligators are adorable, so I figured I'd pull up a little photo just so you can see them. Okay, so that's American alligators. Now, American crocodiles, again, look more like this. So you got that same V-shaped uh, nose to it. The habitat of the American crocodile consists largely of coastal areas. It's also found in river systems, but tends to prefer salinity, resulting in species congregating in brackish lakes, lakes, mangrove swamps, mangrove swamps, excuse me, lagoons, caves, and other small islands. So where you might find your American alligator more on the freshwater side of Everglades, you'd find your American crocodile on the saltwater side. Other crocodiles also have a tolerance to salt water due to this uh, to the salt glands under their tongue, but the American crocodile is the only species, other than the saltwater crocodile, that commonly live and thrive in salt water. Also, if you remember back when we talked about turtles, turtles have a, a trick where they can get rid of the salt, excess salt, by crying it out. So crocodiles get rid of that excess salt under a gland underneath their tongue, uh, which I don't have, so I can't show you, but, but that's, uh, that's how they approach it. Slightly different adaptation to the same sort of problem. American crocodile is one of the larger crocodile species, so males can range can reach lengths of 20 feet long and weigh up to 2,000 pounds, so that's twice as heavy as the, the American alligator and uh, a little bit longer. Yeah, about another person longer, so longer. On average, though, uh, mature males range between about 9.5 feet to 13.5 feet and weigh about, uh, excuse me, yeah, weighing up to 2,000 pounds. As with the other crocodile species, females are smaller and rarely exceed 12 feet in length, uh, even in the largest body, pop body populations. Sometimes you'll hear a crocodile called a sharp snout alligator, which is 
kind of funny. Not super correct, but kind of funny. And a way to remember that it's that V shape. All right, so next let's talk a little bit about crocodilia in general. So let me pull up a quick photo. This is the two of them side by side. So you can see a little bit, it's a little bit too off in the distance, but I thought it was a, a fun picture because it's something that's sort of unique to the Everglades where you would get these two crocodiles hanging out together. They don't really like to go around, but they aren't necessarily um, uh, mean to each other. So crocodilia in general have teeth about 74 to 80 teeth, and they're able to replace each of those 80 teeth up to 50 times in their 35 to 75 year lifespan. It's a lot of numbers. So 80 teeth, they can replace them at up to 50 times, which is more than they probably need, and they live between 35 and 75 years. It's a type of animal that, that uh, unlike humans, has uh, can regrow its teeth at over time. The uh, American alligator in particular, uh, crocodilians and the American alligator in particular, hold the record as having the long largest laboratory measured bite of any living animal. So they have the, um, sorry, the strongest laboratory measured bite of any living animal. And so you may have seen this if you, if you encountered alligators before or crocodiles before. Their bite is very strong, so when they close their mouth it's very strong. But it's very weak when they try to open it. And so you can actually hold an alligator or a crocodile's mouth closed just with your hands or with a bit of tape. So when they transport uh, crocodiles or alligators, they just wrap up their mouth with some tape, and that's sufficient. Has anyone seen this sort of demo done in real life, by the way? This uh, kind of crocodile wrestling? It's kind of fun. So I, I got to see it uh, down, I don't remember what state it was, but it was a long time ago I got to see the uh, crocodile wrestling. A neat thing to go for. We are coming out of Taylor Slough, up behind us here, and heading over to the Florida Bay. So we're going to fly off to the Keys a little bit. For those of you who are here for Dry Tortugas, you'll recognize some of the, the same sort of key structure. It's that same general area. Uh, Dry Tortugas is managed by the Everglades National Park uh, team as well, so it's a similar group. I think uh, I'm thinking about that uh, crocodile wrestling, and I remember a pretty funny conversation which was you have this professional up front who's wrestling an alligator and holds the mouth shut and, and kind of says oh it's so easy like look at how you do this and I remember being a kid going like oh okay yeah cool I'll just go wrestle the next alligator I see um, but they had a they had a particular warning about that in the show anyway uh, the teeth of the American alligator are designed to grip prey but they can't rip or chew flesh like the teeth of some other predators and so they depend on their gizzard instead to digest their food uh, domesticated food, excuse me. So they can grip their prey, but they can't really chew it in the same way that we can. Uh, this is what the skull looks like. So it's got those, those uh, good te teeth are gripping. As far as the uh, skin of an alligator, so it looks kind of like this. Some of you have probably seen this before. It's thick and contains keratin for strength and protection, and is clad in no non-overlapping scales. You notice they're not overlapping like you would see in like a snake, uh, known as shoots. Many of the shoots are strengthened with bony plates, known as os osteoderms, uh, which are the same size and shape as the superficial scales, but grow beneath them. There are numerous in the back and the neck, and they form a sort of protective armor. So you'll notice in a lot of these photos, there's these like on the tail here or along the spine, there's these um, kind of bony flesh that becomes a bit of armor for them. That's what that is. When an alligator wants to get around, and some of you have probably seen videos of alligators walking through golf courses or, or doing alligator things uh, or crocodile things in their, in their free time. So to, to move around, they, they sort of, on, on land at least, they have two different ways they'll do it. They either go for a low walk or a high walk. So a low walk is where they'll have their belly just barely off the ground and that um, it's a little bit slower, but it's uh, just a way that they can, they can move around. That sort of looks... Uh, there's a photo, but I'm not certain that it's what a low walk looks like, so I'll describe the low walk and then we'll, we'll talk about a high walk more. The high walk of a, of a crocodilia, uh, where its belly and most of the tail is off the ground, is unique among the living reptiles. It somewhat resembles the walk of a mammal with the same sequence of limb movements. So they actually kind of straighten out their arms and then they do this walk that looks like a mammal would walk. Which if you think about like a salamander or another kind of lizard, you see them kind of flailing their arms out and they don't really walk like a, 
like a mammal, but a crocodile actually kind of does. It's interesting to see. They can run in short sprints uh, at about 8 miles per hour, so they're quick enough on land. In the water, uh, American alligators swim like fish. Uh, alligator, or I'm sorry, alligator, <laughs> crocodilia in general swim like fish. So, I can show a quick photo of what that looks like. Where's that? I don't know if I pulled up the high walk photo. Let me make sure I showed that one. So, so it's just sort of uh, wagging their tail back and forth in that situation. And that's that high walk that I was talking about. The American alligator's abdominal muscles can also alter the position of their lungs within their torso so they can move their lungs around, allowing them to shift their center of buoyancy and allow them to dive, rise, or roll within the water. So I have a photo a little bit later of a crocodile just sort of hovering with its eyes just above the water, and when we, when we see that one, you can think about the fact that they can shift their lungs location to allow them to, to do that sort of maneuver. Crocodiles have a lot of senses that are specifically adapted for hunting, and so we'll talk through a couple of those. Let me uh, take my chat. Uh, odd reason. <laughs> That's pretty funny. We go uh, crocodile wrestling. If you do, you got to make sure you uh, you send a, a picture to all of us in the in Discord. Be a, be an okay way to go, I think. I think crocodile wrestling is like a a last act before you. Uh, where you kick out. I mean, don't do that anytime soon, but yeah. it's, a, it's a good way of all uh, Speaking of, of crocodiles hunting, so they have a particularly good night vision and they're mostly nocturnal hunters. They use the disadvantage of most of their prey in that they have poor nocturnal vision as an advantage to them. Uh, it's assumed that crocodiles in, or crocodilia in general see colors uh, because they have all the right equipment for it. And they also have that vertical slit uh, shaped pupil, which is similar to that of a domestic cat. So this is believed to be more effective than a circular pupil for excluding light, and so helps protect them also in the daytime uh, from, from bright lights. So that's a crocodile. Uh, crocodiles have a very well-developed sense of smell and allows them to detect prey or animal carcasses on land or water at long distances and they can hear particularly well. Their eardrums are also concealed by a uh, flap that they can raise or lower by with their muscles. So they can actually uh, close off their ears if they need to or, or put them back up. I love this, this game does a really good job, I think, with the tropical areas. It kind of captures that sort of, I don't know, really, really pretty green color. Do a little rotate around here. So like I mentioned, crocodiles are particularly adept at hunting. The nostrils, eyes, and ears are situated at the top of the head, so the rest of the body can be concealed underwater for surprise attacks. So those three senses that I just said were such a big advantage to them, they put all of those right at the top, and then they can control their lung location and just kind of sit in the water like that, look for, for their next um, hunt. They also tend to be the top of their food chains because they're very uh, adept hunters in whatever the watery environment they find themselves in. In particular, American crocodiles are considered apex predators, and they can hunt and eat anything in the aquatic or terrestrial land that they encounter. Uh, and everything's potential prey to them. Odd reasoning, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, okay, so crocodiles in general, they're stock and ambush type predators, so they uh, will kind of creep up on their, on their prey, but it kind of depends on the different species on how they're going to approach it. They're also unable to chew. I kind of mentioned before that they don't have the right teeth for that sort of thing. What they end up doing when they hunt is they need to break the, the animal into different parts, something that they can swallow whole. And so one thing they could do is they could just let it decompose a little bit more and then come back later. So that's an approach. Uh, the other thing that they can do, though, is something called the death roll. And the death roll is where they grab onto the, the animal, and then they kind of flail their tail in a spiral. And that causes the... Uh, it allows them to, to rip off pieces of the animal, but it's also this kind of uh, fanatical-sounding maneuver 
I couldn't find any videos, uh, maybe fortunately, um, but I couldn't find any videos in Creative Commons. So if you want to look into into that, the crocodile death roll. Obviously. Yeah, fractals. It is. It is metal. As far as uh, calls, crocodiles are the most vocal of all non-avian reptiles and have a variety of different calls, depending on the age, size, and gender of the animal. The American alligator in particular form vocalizations to declare territory, distress, uh, signal distress, threaten competitors, and locate suitable mates. Both male and females billow loudly by sucking air into their lungs and blowing out an intermittent, low, deep tone roars to attract mates and declare territory. We'll play a recording of what that sounds like. You can probably hear it. I'll do. I'll show Wikipedia anyway, because it's good for attribution. Alright, so this is the billow sound. Phones are kind of acting up, so let me know. Hopefully, you can hear that a little bit. It's it's super super deep, so that billowing chorus can be induced by tuba players, sonic booms, or large aircraft that are passing. Yeah, yeah, I would also run for my life. I think the the other cool part about it is they, when they come to the surface, if they do it on the water, it causes the water in front of them to kind of ripple. They call it a water dance, and so it has this like really deep tone, and then it has this rippling water that comes out from the alligator. I would run, though, if I saw that, as cool as it is. Or get your last recording before you go. All right. So to close out, the alligators and crocodiles are both staples of Everglades National Park. You can tell them apart by their nose shape. Crocodiles have a V shape, and alligators have a U shape. Both have about 80 teeth that are replaced throughout their life, and they have muscles for closing their jaw but not opening, meaning they can uh, be held closed with hands or tape. They are apex predators and excellent hunters, and they have advanced and highly adept senses to, uh, to facilitate their hunting. Before I do my uh, cheesy joke, let me show a couple of pictures from the last bit. So we saw a, a video that had a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff from the park. So this will look kind of familiar. So this is the Everglades. This is that river of grass that we were flying over a little bit ago. And this is the view from the sky that you would see. This is a sunset picture over that same river of grass. And then just a minute ago, we transitioned out of that sawgrass and into the coastal habitat. So that kind of looks like this as it fades between the two. And remember, this is a slow flowing river. So everything's just coming out through the bay out that way. And then we are currently over Florida Bay, which looks a little bit like this. You might remember that when we flew out to Dry Tortugas. And if you were on one of the keys, like something that we would see right out the window right now, uh, this is sort of what it, what it looks like. <laughs> uh, fractals. Excellent. Okay, so we talked about alligators, talked about crocodiles. I gave you a couple tips for telling them apart. But, you know, the best way to tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile, uh, or, or at least the, the easiest way to tell the difference, one will see you later, and one will see you in a while. All right, you're welcome for that. <laughs> so, person of the week this week is Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is a really important person for this particular park. She's called the Great Dame of the Everglades. It's a picture of her uh, in her senior year. She lived to be about 98 or so. There's, um, she has a, a long, long life. So Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was born in 1890 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and lived until 1998. She was an American journalist, author, and women's suffrage, suffrage advocate and conservationists known for her staunch defense of the Everglades against efforts to drain it and reclaim land for development. Moving to Miami as a young woman to work for the Miami Herald, she became a freelance writer and produced over 100 short stories that were published in popular magazines. 
Her most influential work was the book The Everglades, River of Grass, which came out in 1947. So that's where that term River of Grass comes from. It was her book that coined it. Which redefined the popular conception of the Everglades as a treasured river instead of a worthless swamp. So coming into this stream, uh, whatever your conceptions of the Everglades were, I hope you walk away with this feeling of it. It's sort of a giant river that's moving. It's a lot, a lot more poetic, and it's not just something to be, to be developed over. As a young woman, Douglas was outspoken and politically conscious of the women's suffrage and civil rights movements. She was called upon to take a central role in the protection of the Everglades when she was 79 years old. For the remaining 29 years of her life, uh, she was a relentless reporter and fearless crusader for the natural preservation and restoration of South Florida. Her tireless efforts earned her the variations of the nickname Great Dame of the Everglades. She received numerous awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and was inducted into several halls of fame. Douglas lived till she was 108 years old, working until nearly the end of her life on the Everglades restoration. Upon her death, an obituary in the Independent in London stated, In the history of the American environmental movement, there have been few more remarkable figures than Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. It's always nice in these parks, I feel like you stumble on uh, people who really had a big impact in, in these areas. Uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is definitely one of those. All right, with that, let's move to our second topic today. Uh, let me see, Fractals, do you mind putting up the, uh, the poll for this one? Give folks a second, I, I think it'll display. We'll see how it goes. And what we're coming up on now is called Cape Sable. So the Flamingo Visitor Center was at the end of that drive when we went with the, the park ranger at the beginning. So he ended at Flamingo Visitor Center. This is Cape Sable, Sable excuse me, from an aerial shot. And we'll fly over. You'll see in the top of that photo, there's a lot of rivers up here. So we're actually going to fly right along the coast uh, and cross over that, that big section. Real quick while I have this up, there's also, uh, this is another one of those national parks where it has great views of the stars at night. And so this is a photo uh, facing south is where they recommend to see the Milky Way. Okay, oops. All right, what are lenticels? Is it the natural slash marks of the, birch of, uh, of the barks of a birch tree? Or is it a pore providing a pathway for the direct exchange of gases between the internal tissues and atmosphere through the bark? I'm going to have to find my word count limit on these. Apparently, I'm, uh, I'm going too long on them. Or is it the lightly colored spots found on some apples and pears? Lenta cells. Give people a second to vote. So our second topic today is mangroves, uh, which is a type of plant. And so a mangrove is a, sh uh, sorry, a connection to the park. So mangrove trees cover the coastlines of South Florida, sometimes growing inland depending on the amount of salt water present within the Everglade ecosystems. There are three species of mangroves tree mangrove trees. There's red, black, and white. Let me show some pictures real quick. So this is the red mangrove tree, black mangrove tree, and I couldn't find any better pictures of the white mangrove tree, but this is a picture of their leaves at least. So you know they exist. So what is a mangrove? A mangrove is a shrub or small tree that grows in a coastal, saline, or brackish water. The term is used for tropical coast vegetation consisting of such species. So it's kind of a general term for a lot of different types of species. All right, I see a bunch of votes coming in. Let me see if I can do a quick tally. Okay, we got a lot of votes coming in for B, a couple for A, a couple for C. Probably a uh, probably good to call the poll. So I will, this was a little bit of a trick poll. So a lenticel is all three of those things. Uh, the kind of definition is the middle one. So it's a pore providing a pathway for direct exchange of gases between internal tissues and atmosphere through the bark. But it is also the slash that you see on a birch tree and the lightly colored spots on some apples and pears. We'll talk about that in just a minute when we talk about how mangroves breathe because lenticels is very important to them. All right, so a mangrove, like I said, they live on the coastline, and so underneath the water is where you get a lot of the magic of the mangrove. So this is a picture of the root system underneath. Kind of see what it looks like. Mangroves occur worldwide in the tropics and subtropics, mainly between the latitudes of 25 degrees north and 25 degrees south. 
The total mangrove forest area of the world in 2000 was 137,000 square kilometers, 53,000 square miles, and spanned 118 countries. Which makes me wonder, has anyone got to see mangrove forests before? If you've been to Florida, you might have, but if you've been to any of the places on this map, you also may have, because there's tons and tons around. The pop outs. This is the Flamingo Visitor Center. So there's that, that park trail that that video drove down, and it's right here. All right, I'll keep flying over Cape Sable. Quick example from Thailand, for instance. So this is the uh, largest native area of native mangrove forest in Thailand. A beautiful, beautiful sort of area. Sailor guy, yes, you got to see mangroves. Where do you get to see mangroves? All right, so mangroves are salt tolerant trees, which is uh, a salt tolerant plant is called a, a halophyte, and are adapted to life in harsh coastal conditions. They contain a complex salt filtration system and complex root systems to cope with the saltwater immersion and wave action. They are adapted to the low oxygen conditions of waterlogged mud. So let's start first with the harsh conditions. So the intertidal existence. I'm Rosno, you got to see them in Central America and Malaysia. Costa Rica, so like guy, cool. My wife and I love Costa Rica. Uh, okay, so harsh conditions. So the intertidal existence to which these trees are adapted represents the major limitation, represents a major limitation on the number of species able to thrive in that habitat. So because the tide comes in and out, it limits the types of, of plants that can actually uh, reasonably grow there. High tide brings in salt water, and then when the tide recedes, solar evaporation of the salt water in the soil further increases the salinity. Then the return of the tide can flush out those soils and bring back new saline. Uh, salinity levels compared to bring the salinity levels back to seawater. So as the tide recedes, water evaporates, and you get an even saltier kind of mix that, you have, that the mangroves have to deal with, something that would kill a lot of plants. At low tides, organisms are also exposed to increased temperature and reduced moisture, moisture before then being cooled and flooded by the tides. They're changing uh, moisture, they're changing temperature all day long, a lot of stress for a plant. To survive in the environment, it must tolerate broad ranges of salinity, temperature, and moisture, as well as a number of other key environmental factors, and only a few types of species can actually pull that mix off. Each species has its own solutions to these different problems, uh, each mangrove even within the mangrove species. Uh, these may be the primary reason why, on some shorelines, mangrove trees often show distinct zonation. So if you look at the shoreline of Florida, you'll see uh, clumps of red mangroves together with clumps of black mangroves, probably because they have just slightly different solutions to, to how to deal with the tides. Oop, quick time check on this, okay. Let me do, let me talk through a little bit about the mangrove piece. Uh, and fractals, if you want to start putting up the last part here, we can talk about the next park we want to go to as well. Let's see where my destination is. All right, we're going to zip past a little bit of this because seeing Thousand Islands is very much worth it. Sorry, Flying Singer. I'm zipping along here. So mangroves are salt-tolerant trees. Uh, sorry, we talked about that already. This is that river that I mentioned. Let's see. I'm going to come right up in here. So Thousand Islands is a particularly well-known part of the park, a very pretty park to go go see, so we'll drop ourselves right here. Okay. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, they have to deal with levels or problems of low oxygen, so red mangroves can survive by propping themselves out of the water on stilts and then absorb air through the pores in their bark. Those pores are called lenticels. So it's the same thing that you see in birch trees. And, oops, I should do it like this. People can vote in the park. So it's the same sort of thing you see on birch trees and also what you see on fruits like apples. I actually brought a pear because I had noticed the pear I was about to eat for dinner had uh, lenticels in it. So that is just a way for uh, air to be exchanged into the bark or into the actual cells itself. 
black mangroves then live on, so that was red mangroves, black mangroves live on higher ground and many make uh, this sort of specialized root structure that sticks out of the ground. So we see this, this is a, a black mangrove's root structure. They become sort of like straws that they can breathe through. They're also covered in lenticels. To deal with the salt water, they have, uh, red mangroves have uh, specifically significantly impermeable roots, which means that they can keep most of the salt out of their roots themselves. Uh, other mangroves have an adaptation that allows them to secrete salt from their leaves. So you can actually find leaves that look like this, kind of this salt-covered thing as they excrete them out of glands then. To ensure offspring in these kind of harsh environments, mangroves will actually grow something called a propagule. And a propagule is sort of like, it's like you're, instead of a seed that germinates in soil, it'll germinate while still attached to the parent tree, so it looks kind of like that. And these then, and it can produce its own food by, for, by photosynthesis. Eventually that drops to the ground and it can float in the water for a long time. Once it reaches the shore and it's ready to route to root, excuse me, it can actually change its density so that it floats instead of sideways. It'll float uh, vertically, and that allows it to get better lodged into the soil. And if it finds that the conditions are not hospitable, it'll actually redistribute its density and continue floating uh, horizontal. A smart little plant. They can also remain dormant for over a year before arriving at that suitable uh, environment. So they have quite a few adaptations for that sort of thing. The ecosystems that the mangrove roots offer are pretty unique. So a lot of animals will live in and among the route, uh, the roots, excuse me, um, and they support tons and tons of kinds of things: algae, uh, barnacles, oysters, shrimp, um, manatees, is a big, big one as well. They also protect the coastline from erosion, uh, things from storm surges, for instance, uh, hurricanes and tsunamis. They'll, they'll at least minimize the destruction there. They're also effective, that root system that we talked about is effective at dissipating wave energy. So like uh, when a, uh, it means that when waves come in, they aren't gonna pull as much of the sediment away. So mangroves can kind of build their own environment that they wanna live in. Uh, because of the uniqueness of the ecosystems and the protection they provide against uh, erosion, this is why a lot of these areas need to be so intentionally protected. We go. We got two minutes here. Oh, all right. Sounds like we need a tiebreaker from uh, from the wife. So we'll see if she'll she's willing to do one of those. Uh, I think the tie will be in sync. Guadalupe. Okay, Guadalupe Mountains National Park. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go Guadalupe Mountains National Park next week then. Uh, so let me quick close out mangroves. I'll do a, a, a little joke and then we'll. Uh, We'll sign off for the week. So mangrove is a shrub or small tree that grows in coastal saline or brackish water. They're highly adept to survive in the coastal condition, coastal environment, and increase their likelihood of reproduction using propagules. They provide a unique and critical ecosystem as well as erosion and coastline protection. I stumbled on this particular joke and it covers both the topics we talked about today. So I'm sure I kind of liked it. It's a bit of a story joke, but I'll go, I'll go through it. So a man is canoeing in the Everglades, probably in Thousand Island area here. After spending the day exploring, things looked vastly different than what he remembered, and he realized he's lost. To make matters worse, a large reptilian appears to be swimming under and around his boat, and the sun is starting to drop. At his wit's ends, he yells, Darn it! I'm lost! The animal surfaces and says, See that island there? Go around to the right-hand side. If you go to the left-hand side of the island, you'll get into shallow water and, and get tangled in a bunch of mangrove roots. From there, follow its contour until the sun is directly to your right, and the correct heading on your compass will be 285 degrees in 30 minutes. 300 meters straight ahead from there, you should see your truck. Frightened, the man begins paddling hard, but realizing what he's heard, thinking, in, thinking he's maybe hallucinating and his subconscious knows how to get home or something like that. The crocodilian follows him. Astoundingly, he sees his truck just as the animal pulls up next to him. Unfortunately, he's exhausted and hesitant to hop to the shore for fear of being devoured by the crocodilian. The animal surfaces and says, there you go. See, your truck. Have a great night. The man, now realizing that he was not hallucinating, gasps, thanks. But uh, wait a minute. I've lived in Florida my whole life, but never seen your kind of crocodilia. Uh, or what kind of alligator are you? The crocodilian says, you're very welcome. And now you can tell your friends that you've met a navigator. 
<laughs> okay. So with that, uh, today we talked about Everglades National Park. We talked a little bit about uh, mangrove trees. We talked about crocodiles and alligators. We talked about uh, Marjorie Douglas. I forgot her last name. Oops. Um, Marjorie, who wrote The River of Grass. Um, sorry, I should have that. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, in fact, I was supposed to up some of the links, so thank you very much. Uh, happy to have you in the discord uh, community if you want to come hang out otherwise uh on twitter for just general notifications and we will be exploring guadalupe mountains national park next week so with that thank you for being my co-pilot today and until we meet again stay curious and keep on exploring and i'll see you all next week <laughs>